Good afternoon to all. Um, welcome. Uh, please silence your cell phones. That's uh, the first uh, news that I'm supposed to give you. And also that the, the channels for the translation from Spanish into English is number four, and from English into Spanish is number five. On behalf of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, thank you very much for your presence. And also thanks to everybody who's watching this event via webcast at the Commission's website, uh, iachr.org. Um, this is an event to present our report called Violence Against LGBTI Persons in the Americas. And at the end of the intervention from our panelists, there will be time for questions from the audience. Uh, where we will have a microphone provided for that purpose. So to start with today's event, let's welcome IECHR President, Commissioner James L. Cavallaro. Commissioner Cavallaro is a citizen of the United States. He is a lawyer with an undergraduate degree from Harvard College, as well as a law degree from the University of California at Berkeley, and a PhD in Human Rights and Development from the Universidad Pablo de la Vide from Sevilla, Spain. And currently, Professor Cavallaro is a Professor of Law at Stanford Law School, and also the founding director of both the International Human Rights and Conflict Resolution Clinic at Stanford, and the Stanford Human Rights Center. Previously, Commissioner Cavallaro was a clinical professor of law at Harvard Law School and executive director of the Human Rights Program at Harvard. He founded the Brazil-based Global Justice Center and served as director of the Brazil offices of Human Rights Watch and the Center for Justice and International Law, CEGIL. He is the author of dozens of articles, books, and other publications on human rights and the inter-American human rights system. Many thanks, Mario. Uh, let me uh, offer my welcome uh, to my fellow panelists, uh, Comisionado Francisco Eguiguren, uh, Consul uh, Lee, uh, Anna Montano, Andrew Stevenson from the State Department, Sne Rao, uh, also my colleagues here, my fellow commissioners who I see in the front row, uh, fellow staff from the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, members of the academic community, uh, members of the public in general. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you, members of the diplomatic corps as well, I understand, uh, are present. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's an honor to be <clears throat> releasing this report here in San Francisco. I'd like to say a few brief words about the report and then we'll move on with the other uh, panelists. Uh, the report that we're issuing is a regional report, it's a hemispheric report on violence committed against lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and intersex LGBTI persons or those perceived as LGBTI, persons with non-normative sexual orientations or gender identities and expressions, or those whose bodies differ from the socially, generally socially accepted male or female standard. In the region, uh, we should note that some countries have made significant progress in recent years in recognizing the rights of LGBTI persons, but there are still very high rates of violence in all countries in the hemisphere. As the many testimonies included in the report demonstrate, this violence tends to be extremely brutal. The everyday violence that affects LGBTI persons often tends to be invisible. Uh, it is not reported uh, generally or always to authorities or covered appropriately uh, in media sources. The report focuses on violence against LGBTI persons as a complex and multifaceted social phenomenon and not just as a series of isolated incidents or individual acts. Uh, for example, uh, the report analyzes the way in which violence, violence against intersex persons is based on prejudice toward body diversity and specifically toward those whose bodies differ from what is considered male or female. The violence suffered by intersex persons for the most part, is different from that suffered by lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans LGBT 
persons. As Commissioner Aguiwurin uh, will illustrate in a minute when he gets into uh, greater detail. Many of the acts of violence against LGBTI persons, often referred to as hate crimes, are better understood, we believe, as part of the concept of violence based on prejudice towards non-normative sexualities and identities. Different sexual orientations and identities challenge fundamental normative notions about sex, sexuality, and gender. Violence and sexual violence against LGBT persons are used often to punish and denigrate those who do not fit into these concepts because of their sexual orientation or gender identity or expression. This violence evidently uh, has an unfortunate symbolic impact as well as it sends a message of fear and terror to the entire LGBT community. I won't go into detail about uh, the current political moment, but I will just say uh, that this report is particularly relevant today in the hemisphere. Uh, it's particularly relevant in this country. It's particularly relevant in a moment in which all of us <clears throat> who defend human rights, all of us who believe in human rights, all of us who believe in the core principle of human dignity have reason to believe that the challenges ahead will be quite significant. We also, I think, have reason to believe that there is vast support, there is vast goodwill, there is vast organizational capacity that has been demonstrated in, in recent days. Uh, we hope, and I will say this in, uh, on behalf of the Commission, we hope that this report and our work in defense of the rights of LGBTI persons on behalf of all persons uh, can serve to all those groups and individuals who see this moment as particularly critical and who are seeking <coughs> discourses, legal reference points, institutional support, uh, in short, who are seeking bases and areas to work with and to work together uh, to promote human rights in the hemisphere, which is ultimately the core guiding principle of the Inter-American Commission. Uh, thank you for your patience. Without more, let me turn the uh, floor over to the next panelist. Actually, to our MC, Mario Lopez, who will turn it over to the next panelist. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Commissioner President. To continue our program, I would like to introduce Commissioner Francisco Jose Iguren Praeli. He is the first Vice President of the Inter-American Commission, and he is also the thematic rapporteur on the rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and intersex persons. Commissioner Iguren is a citizen of Peru. He holds a law degree from the Pontifical Catholic University of Peru, as well as a master's degree in constitutional law and a PhD in humanities. He was Minister of Justice of Peru, as well as ambassador of his country to the Kingdom of Spain, among many other responsibilities in his, in his public life. He is currently a legal consultant and advisor at both the national and international level, and he specializes in issues relating to constitutional law, administrative law, and human rights. Commissioner Giguren is now presenting the IECHR report on violence against LGBTI persons in the Americas. Muchas gracias, Mario. I will make my speech in Spanish, but you have translation. <laughs> Excuse me. Eh, muchas gracias eh, por acompañarnos eh, esta noche aquí. Eh, es un momento muy importante para la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos y para mí. Realizar la presentación de la versión impresa en inglés de este informe aprobado por la Comisión en diciembre del 2015 sobre violencia contra personas lesbianas, gays, bisexuales, trans e intersex. Eh, Diré que este informe, eh, en su versión original eh, español, eh, 
fue presentado en su momento eh, en Washington en nuestras sesiones de inicios del año pasado, marzo-abril, eh, y tenemos ya, gracias al esfuerzo y a, a apoyos, pues de contar con una versión en portugués en, que fue presentada por mí en Brasil eh, a fines de octubre pasado en tres ciudades de Brasil y ten, tenemos ya por fin también la versión impresa en inglés que presentamos aquí en esta histórica San Francisco tan relevante para lo que significa el movimiento por los derechos de las personas LGBTI. Por eso digo que para nosotros es un gran honor presentar este informe en su versión impresa en inglés, ahí tienen ejemplares a la entrada, aquí en San Francisco. Ya nuestro presidente James Cavallaro dio algunos eh, alcances sobre aspectos centrales de, de este informe. Yo solamente comentaré algunos otros asuntos. Tenía una presentación, pero en aras de no repetir, eh, pues voy a obviar un poco algunas cosas. Eh, solo diré, para empezar, que como él muy claramente ya señaló, este informe de la Comisión tiene como centro eh, dar cuenta, presentar con preocupación la violencia perpetrada contra personas LGBTI eh, motivadas normalmente o, o percibidas como tales, motivadas por su eh, orientación sexual, identidad o expresión de género o no normativas o cuyos cuerpos difieren de los estándares socialmente asumidos o acogidos como los cuerpos masculinos y femeninos. Déjenme comentarles algunas cosas sobre cómo se hizo este informe, porque eso creo que es importante también para mostrar eh, la solidez de sus afirmaciones. Este informe eh, recoge distintas fuentes. Eh, recogió eh, eh, testimonios e informaciones proporcionadas por organizaciones de la sociedad civil, defensoras de los movimientos LGBTI, por estados, por expertos, eh, a lo largo de un periodo, o producidas a lo largo de un periodo de 10 años, de 2005 al 2015. También recogió lo que se había expuesto en nada menos que 37 audiencias sobre estas materias desarrolladas en las sesiones de la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos. También eh, se elaboró una consulta, un cuestionario con preguntas que recibió respuestas de numerosos estados, de organizaciones de la sociedad civil y también un conjunto de testimonios que son recogidos en este informe. O sea, fue el producto de un esfuerzo de recopilación, de sistematización de información proporcionada y de elaboraciones propias de la relatoría sobre esta materia de la Comisión y también de un estudio de casos que a lo largo de un periodo de 15 meses realizó eh, la, la Comisión. Eh, hablar sobre un informe de, en el campo de los derechos humanos sobre un informe que da cuenta fundamentalmente de la violencia, más aún contra un grupo de personas, es sin duda un, ele un elemento poco alentador. ¿no? Normalmente los informes buscan difundir solamente los derechos. Dar cuenta ya de violencia es la mejor demostración que lo que se puede haber ido avanzando en materia de derechos respecto a personas LGBTI es importante, pero es poco y que muchas veces lo consagrado en normas muy positivas en muchos países o en decisiones judiciales muy ejemplares, eh, se ve a veces un poco ensombrecido por prácticas sociales, por conductas sociales de estigmatización, estereotipos, discriminación, violencia física, que es de la que especialmente habla este informe, habla más sobre la violencia física. 
hay avances y el informe lo reconoce. Debemos estar contentas, contentos por ello. La OEA conformó, ha conformado un core group encargado de promover precisamente eh, esta problemática. En este momento entiendo que lo preside Canadá, pero es muy importante contar dentro de nuestra organización de la OEA con esta coalición de estados que está trabajando activamente en esta materia y que nos ha, o, o que hemos compartido espacios en más de una ocasión durante eh, el año pasado. Valoramos mucho eso. Como valoramos mucho las leyes de identidad de género o aspectos similares que se han dado en varios países del continente, son un ejemplo para aquellos estados que mantienen políticas más bien conservadoras, reticentes, discriminadoras, anacrónicas, inhumanas, que creo que es bueno señalar. ¿Cuáles son algunos de los aspectos que podríamos mencionar? Eh, a ver, ¿cuál es el contenido básico de este informe? Este informe, en sus dos primeros capítulos, eh, contiene precisiones conceptuales, definiciones que es importante esclarecer sobre temas tales como orientaciones, identidades de género, cuerpos diversos y la violencia por prejuicio. En el tercer capítulo aborda el impacto que tienen la subsistencia de ciertas leyes en algunos países del continente que continúan penalizando las relaciones sexuales consentidas, libres, privadas, entre personas mayores de edad. Y que si bien se nos dice que en muchos casos estas normas ya no se aplican, independientemente de si eso es cierto o no, su sola vigencia o su sola existencia son un estímulo para fomentar la discriminación y la violencia. Porque si una ley castiga algo, mucha gente dirá Ay, que esa conducta es mala y si yo soy violento contra estas conductas, estoy cumpliendo la ley. Eh, figuras a veces contenidas en estas leyes de manera ambigua, como indecencia grave o moral pública, son directamente utilizadas para perseguir, para reprimir, para violentar a personas de la comunidad LGBTI. El capítulo cuarto eh, analiza distintas formas y contextos que enfrentan las personas LGBTI. Por ejemplo, que muchos de estos actos de, o situaciones de violencia demuestran altos niveles de crueldad, de ensañamiento, de que mucho de lo que a veces se llama también eh, o se ha conocido como crímenes por odio, pues nosotros le llamamos en este informe más violencia por prejuicio. Y que lo grave es que muchas veces estas conductas no son ni siquiera individualizadas en estadísticas o investigadas y reprimidas a los agresores como tal por nuestros sistemas judiciales o policiales. Eso hace más en contribuir a invisibilizar el problema. El informe señala que es importante que los estados asuman un claro compromiso que las investigaciones policiales, fiscales, judiciales tengan como una hipótesis la posibilidad precisamente de una violencia cometida por prejuicio o por odio y que no ello quede diluido en eh, un, una visión genérica como si fuera un caso cualquiera de lesiones, de agresión o de homicidio. Es importante que se documente y se registre las cosas como son, porque el informe también advierte que estos no son hechos individuales. Aunque tengan agresores individuales y víctimas individuales, muchas, reflejan una situación social, una sociedad en la cual en muchos casos persisten estas estigmatizaciones, esta discriminación, esta est estos estereotipos negativos que incentivan a este tipo de conductas violentas. Y si el Estado no investiga estos hechos, no repara a las víctimas, no sanciona ejemplarmente a los agresores, eso se llama impunidad. 
Y la impunidad es otra fuente que alimenta esta violencia contra personas LGBTI. Más grave cuando puede tratarse de una violencia por autoridades, por funcionarios policiales o por criterios discriminatorios de autoridades judiciales o por discursos que alimentan más el odio y la discriminación intolerantes con el respeto a la diversidad y al derecho que tiene toda persona dentro de su libertad de vivir con entera libertad y privacidad su orientación sexual o su identidad de género, su derecho a ser feliz como desea serlo, sin agresiones y sin interferencias. También el informe precisa que, por ejemplo, particulares características encuentra la violencia contra personas trans, contra mujeres trans especialmente, que a veces se refleja en estas conductas sociales de agresión o también de actividad policial frente a manifestaciones públicas de afecto o exclusión de posibilidades de acceso al empleo o a trabajos y que muchas veces son violencias que se inician desde la propia familia. Se señala también que en el caso de mujeres lesbianas o bisexuales también existen niveles importantes de violencia intrafamiliar y a nivel social. En el caso de personas intersex se analiza que es una situación particular, diferente y que claro, un foco particular de violencia puede estar dado en el sometimiento a estos niños, niñas normalmente, pues a intervenciones quirúrgicas o innecesarias o no consultadas o irreversibles que pasan por encima de su derecho a decidir sobre su orientación o su identidad de género y que esto muchas veces también se mantiene en una situación de impunidad. El capítulo quinto analiza aspectos sobre, sobre esta multidimensionalidad del problema, como decía el presidente, cuando se conjugan aspectos como el ser persona de la comunidad LGBTI, pero además poder ser adicionalmente afrodescendiente, pobre, indígena, que agrega a esta situación de riesgo y de violencia factores mucho más agudos, una discriminación múltiple. Y el sexto capítulo da cuenta de las obligaciones que tienen los estados en este campo y el séptimo, las conclusiones y recomendaciones a los estados que son eh, más de 100. Eh, ya he ido adelantando algunas de las constataciones de este informe y para ir culminando, eh, comentaré simplemente algunas de sus principales eh, conclusiones y recomendaciones. Como decía al empezar, el informe reconoce los avances que se vienen eh, produciendo a nivel legislativo. Es alentador, es positivo, hay que destacarlo, pero constata que en la gran mayoría de países de las Américas, incluso en estos que tienen normas o avances, las situaciones de violencia contra personas LGTI continúan y que muchas veces no están debidamente registradas o identificadas, se mantienen en la impunidad. Eh, la relatoría eh, de personas LGBTI eh, lo vamos a confirmar en los primeros días de febrero, pero casi un hecho, tenemos creo ya el apoyo para ello, que vamos a elaborar un informe este año precisamente para recoger los avances y las buenas prácticas a nivel legislativas, judiciales o de políticas adoptadas en estados del continente en lo que respecta a los derechos de las personas LGBTI en distintos aspectos, porque creemos que también es importante seguir en ese terreno recogiendo y será muy importante recibir de los estados y de las organizaciones de la sociedad civil este tipo de avances en sus respectivos países, porque ello nos permitirá poder trabajar más activamente en aquellos estados 
que se mantienen reacios o que están muy retrasados eh, en este campo. Eh, vivimos tiempos eh, difíciles para esta problemática, que no está exenta de retrocesos. Eh, cuando estuve en Brasil, la constante preocupación expresada por las organizaciones en las distintas ciudades era cómo muchos discursos provenientes de las distintas iglesias o evangélicas, cristianas o católicas, en muy, sobre todo en Brasil, pero creo que esto no es solamente exclusivo de Brasil, ocurre en países del Caribe y en muchos países latinoamericanos, en los últimos tiempos han puesto especial agresividad en estos temas, en combatir el tema de género, en combatir el tema de la enseñanza, de políticas públicas que fomenten la libertad y el respeto a las personas LGTBI. Y nos decían en Brasil, eh, hay grandes riesgos de retroceso porque hay discursos muy agresivos que ya no solo se dan en el ámbito religioso, sino cuando el ámbito de algunas personas que por su orientación religiosa ingresan a la política y son parlamentarios o son gobernadores o son presidentes, un discurso agresivo en este campo es una realidad que tenemos que enfrentar. Por eso es importante señalar también los avances que en muchos lugares se vienen dando para difundirlos y para defenderlos. También eh, este, eh, dentro de las conclusiones eh, se insta a los estados a que deban tener un sistema de registro estadístico claramente identificado de situaciones de violencia o crímenes contra personas LGBTI. Porque hay que visibilizar el problema y hay que enfrentarlo. Y como decía antes, hay que investigar y sancionar a los responsables y hay que reparar a las víctimas. Hay que hacer también una política activa a nivel de discurso social. Porque este es un tema que tiene también una base social y el Estado, desde el nivel educativo inicial y las familias, desde su seno más íntimo, pues tienen que trabajar en este campo. Tenemos que trabajar desde la sociedad, desde los medios de comunicación activamente para poder responder, ¿por qué no decirlo?, confrontar a estas posturas agresivas que niegan el reconocimiento a los derechos a personas LGBTI. Tiene que haber, por eso, y esto corresponde a una labor preventiva, a una labor de creación de una cultura social de respeto a la diversidad y a la libre orientación sexual e identidad de género. Eh, es importante, se dice entre las conclusiones, que se deroguen las normas que continúan penalizando en aquellos estados las relaciones sexuales libremente consentidas entre personas mayores de edad del mismo sexo. Es necesario que se adopten leyes de identidad de género que permitan además la libertad de la persona en aspectos tales como poder modificar el registro que les fue asignado en el documento de identidad sin necesidad de someterse a intervenciones quirúrgicas ni tratamientos psicológicos ni hormonas ni cosas que se le parezcan, aspectos que deben ser decididos por la propia persona y no impuestas. Que también se sancione y se combata la realización de intervenciones no necesarias ni consentidas de tipo quirúrgico respecto a personas intersex. Eh, el tipificar claramente, incluso a nivel penal, dentro de las conductas punibles por discriminación, aquellas que se basen o se sustenten en discriminación a las personas por su orientación sexual, identidad de género real o percibida, o por todos los aspectos que puedan tener que ver con ello. Y dentro de este esquema, pues simplemente decir que este informe es un primer paso. Eh, hemos terminado el año y ya lo podemos tener en castellano, portugués eh, e inglés, impreso y difundido. Ayúdennos a seguirlo difundiendo. Se trata de continuar sensibilizando a nuestras autoridades políticas y a nuestras organizaciones sociales y a también los miembros de nuestras iglesias porque la dignidad de la persona humana y el derecho a su libertad 
exige esa igualdad, esa no discriminación y, como decía, ese derecho a vivir sin violencias ni amenazas, ni de entes estatales, ni de individuos o de la sociedad, su derecho a vivir en plenitud de acuerdo a la orientación sexual, identidad de género que libremente decidan. Gracias. Muchas gracias, comisionado, por su interesante presentación. Thank you very much, Commissioner Egi Wooden, for, for your presentation. It was uh, an excellent summary of a, um, a, a very, very detailed report with many conclusions and recommendations. To continue with our program, I would like to introduce Andrew Stevenson, who's joining us today. He's a career civil servant within the political section of the U.S. Mission to the Organization of American States. He has served as Special Assistant to Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs, Wendy Sherman, as Special Assistant to Undersecretary of State for Civilian Security, Democracy and Human Rights, Maria Otero, also as Chief of Staff of the U.S. Mission to the OAS on the Secretary's Policy Planning Staff, and a special assistant to Deputy Secretary of State Robert Zolik. He is the recipient of various superior and meritorious honor awards for his work <coughs> in advancing democracy and human rights throughout the Americas. Previously, Mr. Stevenson worked for the Latin America program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Mr. Stevenson holds a BA in political science from Haver Haverford College, where he was elected into the Phi Beta Kappa and MA from Georgetown School of Foreign Service. He read philosophy, politics, and economics at, at Pembroke College, Oxford, and also studied Latin American affairs at St. Anthony's, Oxford. Today, Mr. Stevenson will be presenting on the United States, the OAS, and the Inter-American Human Rights System. Thank you very much, Mario. I appreciate the chance to be here in San Francisco um, to discuss the overall role of the United States before the OAS, as well as the Inter-American Human Rights System. Uh, again, as a civil servant based in the State Department within the U.S. mission to the OAS, I'm pleased to convey our support um, for the work of the Commission, for the decision taken by the Commission, and with the support of President Cavallaro and all the rest of the commissioners to hold sessions here in San Francisco. Outreach within the United States by international organizations like the OAS and like the Commission can be very useful for us here in Washington because organizations uh, do important work, engagement by organizations outside of Washington in cities like San Francisco is very important for helping us also clarify and explain the mandate of organizations and their roles internationally and domestically. In the case of the OAS and the Commission, the United States is also in the unique position of serving as host for both of the organizations. This is an honor, and it's also something that we take very seriously as an obligation. Bearing in mind, as we all know, that we've just concluded a presidential transition here in the United States, let me begin by sharing some general views regarding our hemisphere, as well as the continued democratic trajectory of our hemisphere. Today, nearly all people in the Americas live in democracies. And we are seeing this progress in citizens who are standing up and saying that violence and impunity are not acceptable through a regional press that's working to hold leaders accountable and also in a robust civil society, including defenders of civil rights and human rights who are demanding <laughs> dignity and rule of law. These trends illustrate the democratic governance remains a common value for all the people of the Americas, which the United States champions in the Americas and at the OAS. Our willingness to partner with countries in our region has long been tightly bound to these shared values. And so we regularly look to regional partners to join us in speaking up whenever and wherever democratic principles we all share come under attack and there are places in our region where those principles are under attack right now. A proactive response to human rights and democratic accountability 
is important because in some countries in our region, <laughs> civil society organizations are facing great challenges and yes, repression. An effective response to such threats can include a variety of bilateral and also multilateral elements, such as stronger protections for human rights defenders or new strategies to strengthen the rule of law to address impunity. In the face of such concerns, the United States recognizes that we cannot be a lone voice calling attention to them. When democracy is threatened in our hemisphere, we encourage all states and all civil society organizations to speak up. To this end, we engage through the OAS and the Inter-American Commission to build support for human rights and democracy throughout our hemisphere. When we speak of the OAS's core principles, we are supporting human rights and democracy. This is because the relationship between Latin America, the OAS, and human rights is a deep and historic one. It's also a legacy which all OAS member states must work together to uphold. For our part, the United States is committed to working to preserve the integrity of the OAS's human rights institutions, the Inter-American Commission, as well as the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. This means we work to ensure their continued independence and autonomy. At the same time, we must also make the case for an effective use of limited resources to support these institutions' mandates. In light of the very challenging budget environments and situations we all face, and we will continue to face. For more than a half century, the Commission, which in many ways is a crown jewel of the OAS, has protected the rights of individuals against government overreach as well as abuse. During the Cold War, the Commission faced down military strongmen, documented forced disappearances, and cataloged the human costs of brutal civil wars, especially in Central America. In the 80s and 90s, as democracy took hold, the Commission buttressed regional progress by challenging impunity, discrimination against women and girls and ethnic minorities, and media censorship. And more recently, it has worked to combat threats against freedom of expression and limits on access to information. In short, the Commission's groundbreaking work has truly changed our hemisphere <coughs> for the better. As a result, there are people who are now alive who would not be but for, for the effective action of the Commission. Those who would violate human rights, restrict civil liberties, or otherwise weaken democracy have also been identified, called out, and deterred. This is to be commended and recognized. To be sure, this can also be difficult and controversial work, but it remains important in ensuring that our hemisphere reflects values which have long bound us together. Our hemisphere can be justifiably proud of the good work that the Commission and the Court have achieved. That said, the foundation for this success and for sustained progress in human rights lies in the continued independence and autonomy of these institutions. Over the past four years, there's been a very robust dialogue in the region and at the OAS regarding the operation of both of these institutions <clears throat> and how they can work more effectively. For its part, the Commission has engaged in a very productive dialogue with member states and civil society and also donors. Several positive challenges have resulted from this dialogue, including a 5% increase in funding. But funding still remains a challenge, which we in the United States are committed to continuing to engage and to support resolution of. For our part, the United States has worked hard to underscore with fellow Latin American and Caribbean countries that the Commission remains a tremendous force for good in our region, deserves defending, and should continue to be strengthened and funded. Working with partner governments and human rights defenders, we resolved in recent years to take actions to help maintain the Commission's funding sources and preserve its independence. Simply put, continued political and financial support to the Commission is key to reinforcing its capacity to help governments address challenges. Let me talk a little bit now about the important efforts of the OAS to advance democracy and good governance, which are also related to the efforts and the mandate of the Inter-American Commission. Most importantly, I want to underscore that the OAS has established a regional consensus on the right to democracy. This was documented in the success of the Inter-American Democratic Charter, which celebrated its 15th anniversary this past September 11th. The unanimous approval of the Democratic Charter by OAS member states served to highlight the fact that democracy has deepened and matured throughout the Americas over the past two decades. 
However, we feel that the work of the OAS in this area is not finished, it's not complete, because urgent challenges to democracy still remain in our hemisphere. With this in mind, the United States supports efforts and proposals which have been advanced within the OAS to identify steps to enhance the organization's capacity to implement the Democratic Charter. Such advances are innovative. They also build on the tangible successes of the OAS in strengthening democracy through the work of the commission, through thematic peer reviews, election observation missions, as well as the work in a very tan uh, tangible way uh, in friendly settlement advanced by the commission. A particular note, I also <coughs> wanted to underscore that the OAS deployed its first electoral observation mission to the United States for the recent presidential election. We welcomed that mission and we continue to urge all other member states to do the same. And this leads me to my last point this evening, the importance of continued government engagement with civil society. Through ongoing processes at the OAS and in regional fora, the United States has consistently encouraged Latin American and Caribbean governments to open spaces for dialogue amongst themselves and with citizens. This has resulted in tangible, positive progress. And at the OAS, we've seen a clear increase in the level of civil society participation. And within the region, we are also seeing a rise in institutions and mechanisms for innovative cooperation, in particular in the areas of transparency and impunity. And the Commission, as well as the OAS, <coughs> have been leaders in this field. And in particular, I would point to the issues uh, that are being worked on both in Honduras and in Mexico. For our part, we're also matching words with action in the Americas. We're supporting over 30 democracy, human rights, and labor programs at the OAS in the West, and in the Western Hemisphere through the State Department, which total approximately $40 million. <coughs> Significant portions of this portfolio include projects that support civil society capacity building, the professionalization of journalists, and support for free and independent media. And as tonight's report presentation demonstrates, the United States, through the Department of State, also remains committed to supporting human rights and engagement with civil society, including here within the United States. Our participation in the OAS's LGBTI core group, now led by Canada, and engagement with the Commission's LGBTI rapporteurship also represent areas where partnerships with countries in the Americas can have lasting impacts for all of us. So in closing, I want to thank you for the opportunity to participate in this event and to share views regarding general U.S. <coughs> engagement at the OAS. I welcome views on how the U.S. can continue to work with partners, governments, and civil society alike to address the pressing human rights challenges that continue <coughs> to impact us in the 21st century. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to take your comments back to Washington. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, for your intervention. Um, to continue with our program, we would like to now thank the, the efforts of the member states of the OAS, as mentioned by you, by Andrew, uh, that have been made in, uh, to address violence against LGBTI persons. Last June, in the framework of the 46th OAS General Assembly, the states of Argentina, Brazil, Canada, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and the United States and Uruguay created the OAS LGBTI core group. This semester, that group is being coordinated by Canada. So in that capacity today, we are very glad to receive Mr. Brandon Lee, Consul General of Canada in San Francisco. Mr. Lee was appointed Consul General of Canada in June of 2015 with accreditation for Northern California and Hawaii. He joined the Canadian Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade in 2004. His background is in change management and innovation, and he has held several executive and management positions within the department. From 2007 to 2011, he oversaw reform activities to strengthen Canada's international presence and became the department's <clears throat> first director of innovation. From 2000. 12 to 2014, Mr. Lee held senior positions at the World Trade Organization and the International Committee of the Red Cross, both in Geneva, spearheading major organizational and international reform initiatives. 
Today, he will be presenting on challenges for LGBTI persons in Canada. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm honored to be here this evening to share with you uh, Canada's experience in ensuring respect for diversity and LGBTI rights domestically and internationally. Uh, so thank you for the invitation. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Canada. As a multicultural, multi-faith and inclusive society, we believe that Canada is well positioned to champion peaceful pluralism, respect for diversity and human rights internationally. Canadians, we do this by embracing diversity. When Prime Minister Trudeau spoke in front of the UN General Assembly last fall, he told the world that Canada is stronger, not weaker because of our differences. Canada believes that the human rights of all persons are universal and indivisible. And these include, of course, the human rights of LGBTI persons. Canada, we believe we have a lot to contribute to this, this discussion, uh, and we still have a lot to learn. <coughs> I have a, a bit of a cough, so, but I have one candy left. <laughs> uh, in Canada, we call it LGBTQ2, with the number two at the end. <laughs> Aha, thank you. With the number two at the end, uh, because in our Aboriginal and First Nations communities, um, uh, they referred to, to LGBTI people as uh, two-spirited. So Prime Minister Trudeau has asked uh, his special advisor on LGBTQ2 um, issues, Randy Boissonneau, to examine how past laws and policies in Canada have shaped the LGBTI community and what we need to do to address discrimination and marginalization in Canada. And in Canada, action is already being taken. For example, the government recently committed to advancing transgender equality by introducing legislation to add gender identity and gender expression as prohibited grounds of discrimination under the Canadian Human Rights Act. The government has also proposed to add these to categories to the hate crime provisions within our criminal code. And last year, we eliminated discriminatory provisions uh, of the criminal code that required <coughs> a higher age of consent for anal intercourse than for other forms of sexual intercourse. Um, also at the international level, Canada is taking many positive steps to protect the rights of LGBTI persons. Uh, for example, Prime Minister Trudeau raises these issues uh, on social media and in his meetings with world leaders. And he's challenging the world leaders to follow Canada's lead because all citizens of the world should be able to enjoy the fundamental rights that Canadians have fought so hard to achieve. But the Canadian way is not to name and shame. Our Canadian approach is to provide concrete, constructive recommendations in hopes that countries will inspire themselves to reform their own discriminatory laws and public policies. And we know these issues, <coughs> excuse me, we know these issues are difficult for many countries. Uh, and we know that a one size does not fit all. And each country's situation must be considered independently. We're also listening carefully to civil society, including the Dignity Initiative a coalition of Canadian NGOs and experts working to promote international LGBTI rights. And in June of last year, <coughs> the Par Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of our Foreign Affairs, uh, Pamela Goldsmith-Jones, attended uh, the Global LGBTI Human Rights Conference uh, in Montevideo and was there for the launch of an exciting new organization called the Equal Li Rights Coalition. Uh, in which Canada is working together with 33 other countries in Europe, Asia, and the Middle East, and the Americas, to promote equal rights and prevent discrimination and violence on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, however, we believe the real heroes in this struggle are the human rights defenders around the world who promote and protect LGBTI rights 
and work to strengthen the rule of law. So Kanda is also supported to supporting their efforts. We observe and are concerned that governments around the world are using new laws and increasingly harsh tactics to restrict civil society and reverse the gains produced by human rights defenders. And we believe that in order to achieve progress, our multilateral engagement is key. And so Canada has co-sponsored several resolutions on sexual orientation and gender identity, both at the Human Rights Council and at the Organization of American States. We supported the creation of a UN independent expert and a rapporteur at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And we acknowledge the important leadership role of the Inter-American Commission on these issues. And now we're pleased that there is a, an English version of this landmark report, Violence Against LGBTI Persons, so that it can be studied and utilized even more by interested stakeholders. <coughs> I'll just take a drink. So naturally, as a hemispheric partner, we're concerned about the situation facing LGBTI persons within the Americas. We're convinced that the LGBTI core group will help us to better coordinate our efforts and ensure that progress on LGBTI issues at regional and multilateral levels is reflected in the OAS work and activities. Uh, and as mentioned, Canada has taken over the position of chair pro temporaire of this core group for the next six months. Uh, we're confident that with our shared values and our diverse, diverse cultures, we'll be able to find creative ways to contribute to address the challenges we face on this front within our region. Uh, and currently, Canada empowers human rights defenders from around the world to promote positive change within their communities. At our embassies and high commissions abroad, we promote grassroots LGBTI organizations through our projects that combat homophobia and transphobia and advocate for the transitional justice programs, <coughs> community safety programs, police and media training, as well as projects to improve health outcomes within our trans communities. And so these are just a few of the things that Canada is doing. Uh, at the same time, we know that we cannot bring about these changes overnight. So there is much more work to be done, and we should acknowledge and celebrate that the international community has made great strides. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about the situation of LGBTI persons in the Americas from other speakers here this evening and how we can all work towards pos positive change in the LGBTI communities around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Lee, for your intervention and the description of the activities carried out with Canada, within Canada and in, also in the, at the international level. Um, to continue with our program, the Human Rights Commission of the City and County of San Francisco is represented today by Mr. Sne Rao. He is the Senior Policy Advisor and Budget Director at the Commission. He oversees community relations and works closely with minority groups on discrimination, hate violence, and social services. He also leads intergovernmental relations and international partnerships on human rights issues. Before joining the commission, Mr. Rao was a director at an international human rights organization, and he advocated on a range of policy issues affecting human rights in Latin America. He graduated magna cum laude from McAllister College, and he also holds a master in public policy from Harvard University, John F. Kennedy School of Government. Tonight, Mr. Lee is presenting on LGBTQI violence prevention in San Francisco. Thank you so much. I, again, I'm representing the Human Rights Commission. Our um, <coughs> shorthand is HRC. <clears throat> I often have to clarify that HRC is not for the Human Rights Campaign. We're often confused with them. Uh, more recently, we've been confused with 
Hillary Rodham Clinton. We are not connected with her either, unfortunately. <clears throat> Um, and I'm also recovering from a cold. Uh, no one needs to be afraid. I'm not contagious, but I might um, need to pause as I speak. So the Human Rights Commission, what do we do? We work to provide leadership and advocacy to secure, protect, and promote human rights for all people. The Human Rights Commission was established in 1964 during the Civil Rights Movement, and we enforce city laws and ordinances as they relate to non-discrimination in housing, employment, and public accommodations. And the way we work really is we have two divisions. We have our <coughs> non-discrimination division and we have our policy division. The non-discrimination division investigates and mediates complaints of discrimination, non-compliance in employment, in housing, and public accommodation as prescribed by city policy. So here in San Francisco, just like at the state and federal levels, we have protected classes. And so if you are a member of a protected class and you feel that you've experience discrimination, you could come to our commission, file a complaint, and we would investigate that. The policy division is our second uh, unit. And we work closely with other governmental agencies, community-based organizations, and members of the community more broadly to address a wide range of civil rights and social justice issues here in San Francisco. So recently, we've been working closely with the African-American community on criminal justice reform. We also work closely with the Arab, Muslim, and Sikh community on Islamophobia. Obviously, um, our immigrant communities are under attack. We work closely uh, with our immigrant communities to increase bulk awareness on the Sanctuary City Ordinance. And we also work closely with our LGBT community on hate violence. And as I mentioned, the commission has been around since 1964, so we've done quite a bit of work on LGBT rights over our five decades of existence. Um, domestic partnerships, for example, is a concept that was started at the Human Rights Commission that our mayor of the time, Gavin Newsom, embraced and that eventually was embraced at the state level and uh, set um, a movement in motion at the national level. That's one example of the type of work we've done during our five decades of existence. What I want to focus on today is what we've been doing more recently when it comes to LGBT rights. In 2015, we commissioned a needs assessment on violence against LGBTQI communities in San Francisco. You know, San Francisco is often known, uh, not only here in the state and in the, in the United States, but internationally, as a safe haven, as a refuge for LGBTQI communities. And we wanted to analyze the extent to which this uh, was the case today and the extent to which it was not the case. Um, and so we commissioned an assessment uh, specifically on LGBTQI violence prevention that looked at the following seven questions. First, what types of violence affect LGBT people in San Francisco? Second, where do survivors of violence seek support? Third, how do experiences of violence compare across gender, race, ethnicity, sex, age, income level, and other key demographics. Fourth, what are existing violence prevention services for LGBTQI people in San Francisco? And to what degree are these services able to meet the need? Fifth, how does LGBTQI violence compare across LGBT subgroups? And how does service utilization compare across subgroups? I think there's a tendency in well-intentioned movements across the state, thank you so much. Um, I have been wanting this glass of water since I started the presentation, and you might have seen me sip on the few drops that I had left. Again, thank you so much. Um, but you know, there is this tendency um, to, you know, view the LGBTQI community as this broad umbrella, LGBTQI. But what we often forget to do, even in well-intentioned movements in government and outside of government, is take a closer look at unpacking that acronym. You know, how do experiences of trans people compared to experiences of gay people? How do experiences of trans women compare to experiences of gay men? How do experiences of trans women of color compare to experiences of gay white men? Um, these are the types of questions that, that need to be looked at in order to provide services more effectively. And these are the types of questions that we uh, challenged ourselves to do in this assessment. Six, 
What are effective violence prevention models at the local and national levels? Um, what are best practices across the country? Um, and what can we learn from that? And then seven, to what extent are safe spaces useful as a violence prevention tool? In the LGBTQI community, safe spaces are often talked about they're important. Uh, but to what extent do safe spaces meet the needs of LGBTQI people? So that's what we set out to do. Uh, 200 pages later, uh, we came up with a range of findings and recommendations. I'm not going to share all of them in part because I do want to um, you know, leave time for questions and answers. Uh, but let me share some of the key findings. First, high proportions of San Francisco's LGBTQI community has experienced violence. And here are the statistics that show that. 81% have experienced harassment. 68% have experienced physical violence. 48% have experienced sexual violence. And 33% have experienced all three. That is, again, sexual violence, physical violence, and harassment. And this is here in San Francisco. Two, transgender people and particularly women of color, are significantly more likely to experience all three, that's harassment, sexual violence, and physical violence. Three, transgender people, and again, particularly women of color, are up to seven times more likely to feel unsafe and limited by safety concerns as to where they live, as to where they work, as to where they socialize, as to where they receive health and social services. Four, LGBTQI people often do not report violence. When it comes to harassment, 62 people, 62% of respondents said they did not report harassment. When it comes to physical violence, 44% do not report it. And when it comes to sexual violence, 47% do not report it. And the last uh, finding that I want to share as part of this presentation, and I think it's noteworthy for all of us as we work on addressing the needs of LGBTQI people in the areas of violence, is that over a third of LGBTQI people do not trust the police. Um, and underreporting is obviously a significant issue. Here in San Francisco, as I was starting this assessment, I contacted our district attorney's office, their director of public relations, and I said, you know, can you tell me how many <coughs> transgender hate crimes cases you've reviewed? And they said that between 2010 and 2014, they had reviewed 13 transgender hate crimes cases, brought charges in nine of them, and gotten convictions in six of them. Now, that's good work, but it points to the underreporting at play. If you work with the trans community here in San Francisco, if you talk to health and social service providers, if you talk to people on the streets, you know that in the course of four years, certainly there are more than 13 transgender hate crime incidents to investigate. So, I think the data was helpful, not because any of the, the findings were shocking. We're not surprised to hear that trans women of color are not faring as well as other people in the LGBTQI acronym. But this data is meaningful because it shows the gaps that we need to bridge as we work on LGBTQI violence prevention. There were also a range of recommendations. I'm only going to share five of them. The first recommendation was increase funding for culturally competent health and social services. The second was develop a citywide public education campaign on LGBTQI issues. The third was implement sensitivity training for law enforcement. I apologize to the translators. I talk a little fast sometimes. Disculpe a los traductores. Focus policy. The fourth was focus policy on the most vulnerable populations, including the homeless, the undocumented, and those who are engaged in sex work. And fifth, invest in LGBTQI coalition building. And I want to speak a little bit to that one. There are, in San Francisco, we're lucky. We have a range of health and social service organizations focusing on LGBTQI people. But also what happens is when each organization is going at it themselves, sometimes there's a duplication of efforts, and sometimes there's a gap in efforts. And so we really thought it was important to invest in coalition building to bring organizations and service providers together to incentivize their participation in order to reduce gaps and services. Here in San Francisco, our city relies on our social service providers, our nonprofits, to do a lot of the work that we can't. One sixth of city contractors are our nonprofits. We rely on them to provide services. So that's, that's um, the needs assessment that we did here. And I thought it was helpful to share um, a local example of some of the work that the IACHR uh, has talked about internationally. And what I want to continue uh, my presentation on is talking about what we're doing at the local level 
in light of those findings and recommendations. And then finally, I'll draw some connections to the recommendations mentioned in the IACHR report. So in light of those findings and recommendations, we are focusing on transgender coalition building and organizational support services. We developed a partnership with an organization called Taj's Coalition. It was founded after the June 2000, January 2015 murder of a woman in our Bayview district, Taj de Jesus. And we've provided them with $200,000 to develop a citywide transgender coordinating council, anti-violence, public awareness campaigns, and leadership development for trans-serving stakeholders. We've developed a partnership with our SFLGBT Center. The SFLGBT Center here in San Francisco is an anchor for much of our LGBTQI community. We've given them $160,000 to focus on trauma counseling, on peer support groups, and leadership development services for LGBTQI survivors of violence. We're also working on violence prevention and intervention services for transgender Latinas in the Mission District. Uh, for those of you who've worked closely with the transgender community and the Latina community in particular, you know that transgender Latinas lie at the intersection of multiple sources of oppression. They are often undocumented, often monolingual Spanish speaking, at times socioeconomically underserved, and have tough relations with law enforcement, not only in their home countries, but also here in the host country. And so we've given $600,000 to this organization called Ella Para Trans Latinas. It's an education advocacy organization specifically for transgender Latinas to work on case management, community building, and education advocacy services for transgender Latinas. And you might also be aware that transgender people have disproportionate contact with the criminal justice system. They're often profiled and detained, arrested, at rates um, disproportional to the rest of the population. Um, so we're working with a transgender, gender variant, and intersex justice project. It's an organization that focuses on providing reentry services to transgender people who have been incarcerated, and we've given them $325,000. So that's the type of work that we're doing in terms of strengthening community partnerships. And then we're also doing some work at the policy level. Um, the HRC is collaborating with our sheriff's department and transgender community stakeholders to develop and implement inclusionary housing and programming policies for transgender inmates at our county jail. Previously, it was that transgender women, for example, were housed with men. Obviously, that's a safety risk. The report points to that as well, the IACHR report. Now what's going on is that transgender and gender nonconforming people are housed separately in a pod. We're working toward a policy where transgender people are housed according to their gender identity as opposed to their genitalia or assigned sex at birth. And the sheriff has showed tremendous goodwill on this. And so we're working with community leaders to move forward with that policy that affirms people on the basis of their gender identity. We're also working with the San Francisco Police Department on cultural competency and sensitivity training. And we're currently working with them to ensure that transgender people are searched in accordance with their gender identity. In the past, we worked with the San Francisco Police Department and the District Attorney's Office to ensure that condoms are not collected as evidence of sex work. This is a practice that has happened all too frequently here in the United States. Uh, to unpack this a little bit, what was happening was that because sex work is often criminalized, uh, when people are arrested for sex work, condoms were used as evidence of that person participating in sex work. And so, you know, a few years back, the Human Rights Commission started talking to the San Francisco Police Department and said, you know, um, we shouldn't be collecting condoms because sex workers are no longer carrying condoms or have stopped because they're afraid that if they're arrested, this will be proof and evidence against them. Well, the police department said, it's not us, it's the district attorney's office who really wants us to collect this as evidence so that they have a more robust case. And then the district attorney's office said, it's not us, it's the public defender who, if we don't have this type of evidence, the public defender uh, will, will have reason to drop the case. And so obviously the decriminalization of sex work is important and that's something that we need to work on. And where decriminalization is not supported by the political courage, uh, something that we can do is deprioritization. Every district attorney's office has priorities as to what they're gonna work on. Um, immigration authorities have priorities. Under President Obama, obviously there were some communities where less of a priority for deportation as we're learning about more and more. So decriminalization and deprioritization are big issues, but where that falls short, we ask them not to collect condoms as evidence because it was exacerbating the public health goals of the city and county of San Francisco. And um, we got all the agencies together, they cooperated, that was a policy fix that was successful. 
Really quickly in the next one minute, I'll just summarize uh, links to the IACHR recommendations, which is something that Daniela had, had asked to do. And thanks so much for all your work in coordinating this. Um, the HRC's work, I think, aligns well with the recommendations of the IACHR report, particularly as they relate to transgender empowerment, community participation, cultural competency trainings, and police abuse. I think we have to work harder in terms of the recommendation on data collection. Our law enforcement agencies do collect data. If you go to the San Francisco Police Department, District Attorney's Office, they do collect data on gender identity, sexual orientation. But we have a range of health and social service agencies that don't collect data. And it would be important for them to know how many of their clients are LGBT. And for us as a community, it would be helpful for us to know that so that in the future when we're asking for more funding, when we're asking for more cultural competency, we're armed with the data that allows us to do that. I think that's an area where we have to work harder. But more generally, and the report points to this, the challenge for us here in San Francisco really is strengthening access to housing and employment opportunities for LGBTQI people. Issues like homelessness disproportionately affect our LGBTQI people. A recent study found that one in three homeless people in San Francisco is LGBT. Um, this is an area that we're focusing on more and more. And you know, non-discrimination protections are important, right? Like non-discrimination employment, non-discrimination housing. But what's equally important is increasing housing access for LGBT people, not only by providing you know, more affordable housing opportunities, not only by making our shelters more culturally competent, but this is an issue that is obviously um, a very current one in San Francisco, and we're focused on increasing access to housing and workforce development opportunities. LGBTQI people have been marginalized from a lot of socioeconomic opportunities, especially trans people, and an area that we need to work on is workforce development, you know, create that career pipeline. Um, so in short, you know, I, I would say that San Francisco has done a lot of good work, but um, there is no doubt that we have a lot of good work left to do. Thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Rao, for your intervention. I find it very interesting that your commission is only uh, five years younger than ours. <laughs> Our our last panelist is Ms. Ana Montano. She's the founder and executive director of the LGBTI Justice Clinic, Asistencia Legal para Diversidad Sexual El Salvador. She is a public interest and human rights lawyer. Her work is founded in procuring political asylum in the United States for persecuted foreign-born LGBTI persons who are also living with HIV AIDS. As an international social justice activist, she advances the civil rights of LGBTI Latin Americans by advocating for policy reform that will address hate crimes and their historical impunity. Human rights and community service is in Ana Montano's blood. As an immigrant who came of age within the dynamic social and political Latino environment of San Francisco's Mission District, Ana affirmed her lifelong commitment to advocate for the underrepresented. Through her legal and human rights work, she has affected constructive change in the lives of immigrants, the poor, persons living with HIV AIDS, the elderly, and the LGBT community, both nationally and internationally. Um, well, I have a hard act to follow with all these great speakers, all these great people here. Um, but I'm gonna just describe a little bit about uh, myself. I am an attorney here in California and I have the privilege of working with an organization that's called the AIDS Legal Referral Panel. And what we do is that we provide uh, free legal services, pro bono attorneys, for people that, I, that are HIV positive within the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area region. Uh, of course, most of the clients that, or many of the clients that come to us who are HIV positive are also part of the LGBT community. Um, so uh, I've been, I was doing this work, and I work a lot with folks that are uh, asylees. They're seeking asylum here in the United States because of the persecution they've uh, experienced in their country. Uh, you know, violence, uh, violence uh, incarceration, uh, threats to their lives, et cetera. Everything that's in the report, um, most of our clients have experienced. Um, so within the uh, asylum context, uh, of course, the societies come from Latin America, they come from Asia, 
they come from Africa, they come from the Middle East. Basically, it's the same story. Uh, again, I think the report reflects that reality. Um, so in, in doing this work, which I've been doing now for almost at least 14 years, going on 15, I uh, then became very curious about, well, what is going on, let's say, in Latin America, in Central America, and El Salvador, because that's where my family is from. So I wanted to know what's going on with HIV, what's going on with LGBT uh, folks and their situation. So when I went to El Salvador, I was able to meet with uh, the local LGBTI leaders and their organizations. And in that, I realized what uh, a dismal situation it was for the LGBT community. At the same time that year and while I was there, there were almost a serial, uh, well, there were serial killers actually who had targeted transgender women. And so I think while I was there, maybe four of them were killed the day that I was coming back to San Francisco. The newspaper um, you know, showed that there was another transgender uh, woman killed and uh, that affected me very much. So um, I decided that the organization that I work with, which is the AIDS Legal Referral Panel, could be a model to help uh, the LGBTI community in El Salvador, and then regionally, Central America. We hope we, we can have that influence. And so that has been the model. That has been, let's say, our long-term objective to institute a legal services clinic so that the LGBT community of El, Sal El Salvador will have legal access mm -hmm. or access to legal services <clears throat> and justice, which right now really they don't have. Um, so meanwhile, while we're trying to get that you know, organization or that uh, legal clinic up and running, we have gotten involved with working with the local LGBT community in El Salvador on legislative reform and policy implementation. Um, so we were, basically we've been working on this actively since let's say 2013, which is at the time in that year, we organized the first international LGBT conference in El Salvador. And of course, many people from the United States came. Issues of health and discrimination were all addressed. Um, also, the uh, OAS came. Uh, Fanny Gomez and uh, Victor uh, Madrigal were presenters because, you know, in terms of access to justice, we wanted to let the community know there is also another option, which is the Inter-American Commission Court of Human Rights. Um, People weren't, in El Salvador, they weren't so familiar with it. And so I think it was kind of an eye opener for the community that that might be a possibility. And actually in that year, uh, we did help a couple of transgender women from El Salvador travel to Washington to uh, provide testimony. And so that was, uh, those were very big steps I, I feel for the community. At, at an international level, because in El Salvador is a very El Salvador is a very small country, very somewhat closed uh, in terms of well, its society and history and religion and politics, all of that. And so, one of the things that that's very important, I feel, for the LGBT community in Latin America is the international support, um, because otherwise they feel very isolated. Uh, so I, I wanted to say a couple of words on this report, which is, it's beautiful, right? Um, totally thorough. And uh, I like the perspective, you know, of the complexity of the situation for LGBT in these countries. And El Salvador is like that too, because, you know, a lot of these folks have, yeah, issues of sexual orientation, issues of gender identity, poverty, probably being racial, a racial minority or a minority that's, or a racial combination that's not considered, you know, uh, you know in, El, in El Salvador we have a lot of racism between people who are Native American and people who are more European. And so a lot of the transgender community and other LGBT people will fall into the Native American. 
and 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 poor and not educated, whereas maybe if you're pretty much, let's say, a gay man who who is more European, you have privilege, you know, and so you can kind of make your way in society. When you are not in that privileged situation, you really are a target of stigma and uh, discrimination. Um, so the report, as I said, I think it's really beautiful. And actually, we were in El Salvador when it was introduced in Spanish. Mm. And now it's in English, so I was really happy. Uh, but I wanted to say something about reports. So we, we, we all does my organization, uh, also commissioned a report on sexual diversity in El Salvador uh, by the Berkeley Law School. It's a fabulous report. It was um, actually published July 2012. Very thorough, has wonderful recommendations, reflect a lot of the recommendations that are in uh, you know, the OAS report. And actually, things haven't changed that much since 2012. Uh, so that's a little, uh, you know, progress is slow. Also, um, our Canadian friends have recently published a report, also Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada. And again, it's very, you know, very typical of what you'll find in the other reports. Um, and I'm happy that, that they've done these. Um, apparently, Washington School uh, the American University, Washington School of Law, <coughs> and Fanny Gomez, again, is, has just sent a few students, law students, to El Salvador to conduct another uh, report. And basically, <coughs> the reports are going to reflect more or less the same thing. Um, so, you know, where do we go? Uh, where do we go from there? The reports are important, but... <coughs> I don't know if we're maybe spending too much time on them, if we're maybe spending too much resources on them. I'm not sure. Um, but I do um, uh, want to talk about um, the, the fact that what, what let's say, uh, uh, my experiences in El Salvador is a specific Latin American uh, uh, community. And... Uh, one of the things that is happening in El Salvador is the community is, is small. It's not all that large. Uh, the leadership, they take a lot of risk uh, in identifying themselves and being public about who they are and organizing. A lot of the community still lives in the closet. And so the organizers, even though the community is a large community, though the leadership and the organizers are, is a small community. Um, but they're, they're fairly well organized. And one of the most important things that I said is that, you know, this uh, international uh, support that they get. The UN, uh, which has a presence in El Salvador, a very strong presence, has been very supportive. Um, the U.S. Embassy, for example, especially with uh, the ambassador, Maria Carmen Ponte, was very supportive of the of. LGBT. The Berkeley School of Law has been also very supportive because we've come down a few times to El Salvador to work on initiatives. The Canadian, the Canadians have been very supportive. The German Embassy has been very supportive. Another organization that's been very supportive and is trying and is working very hard on trying to do legislative reform so that transgender women can change their names. Because I don't know, in other parts of Latin America, it may be the same, the, the same issue that you have a national identity card. In the United States, we don't have that too much, so we don't really experience that. But that national identity card in El Salvador, you use it for everything. Uh, it's so ubiquitous. And for transgender women, they have their sexual expression, which does not match their national uh, card. And that is a huge obstacle for education, for jobs, for voting, for just about anything. Um, so, you know, it's, it's something that needs to be changed. And the other thing that the community really wants is a hate crimes law to prevent hate crimes. The one thing that happened in El Salvador was that they do now have a uh, aggravated penalties. But... The problem is that penalty is never going to be applied if they're never the, the 
these murders are never investigated. When we started researching, we counted, uh, basically we could only, we, we started researching the, the extrajudicial killings. And at that time there was really only information on the internet and through our research just on the internet, we counted 169 killings. But as of last year, the community is now saying, no, there's been 500 at least because some of them aren't reported, of course. Out of these 500, I think maybe two have been investigated. One of them because the person was an American citizen and the other one, I'm not sure what those details were, but obviously those crimes are, are in total impunity. Um, three years ago, we had a, a, no, a trans woman activist who belonged to one of the organizations. She was murdered. Um, and at that time, we did bring pressure to El Salvador so that they would investigate. At that time also, they had the first lady of El Salvador who was very active in supporting LGBT issues. And so they told us, okay, by May, which is a few months from now, you will have a report. Well, we came back in May, no report. Uh, so there was that initial, you know, uh, fuel that they were gonna do it, but it never got done. Just re and it was really hard to get international uh, attention on that killing. Just last year, another woman who was also with an uh, NGO organizer and a human rights defender was also killed. A lot of international attention, but her case has not been investigated either. So all these cases are definitely uh, in impunity. Now, hate crimes. Um, let's say four years ago, you would never hear that term in El Salvador. Hate crime didn't mean anything. I mean, I mean, it just wasn't spoken. It was not in the vocabulary. So the International Legal Enforcement Academy, through the which is located in El Salvador, they do they train police officers, judges from all of Latin America in El Salvador, and they they instituted the free the first hate crimes investigation training program. Uh, now it's three years that they've done it. They've, let's say, 30, 30 people come to the, these trainings, so what have they done? They've done maybe less than 100, and out of those are four each year El Salvadorians, so maybe there's 12 officers in El Salvador who've had that training. But, you know, it hasn't had that much of an impact in El Salvador, other than the word hate crime is, is now known in El Salvador, and the penalty for hate crime was instituted. Unfortunately, we don't, there's not the hate crime law that obligates the investigation of these crimes. And that's a big, uh, you know, that's just a big de deficit. Um, so that impunity definitely that you see that's reflected in Latin America is definitely uh, the, the reality in El Salvador. I was also asked to make some comments on some of the recommendations that, uh, that are here in this uh, beautiful report. And um, hate speech, you know, a lot of politicians in El Salvador have a form of hate speech. It doesn't come to the level that's uh, identified here, but they talk very negatively about the community. And that incites hate, and it does incite crime and violence towards the community. And it's difficult to control those politicians, right? Um, the media, I feel, also instigate it almost to the level of, of hate speech because whenever anything happens to an LGBT person, that it, it's sensationalized. And there's not really any talk about who that individual was. Right, so you have these these crimes, but it's so sensationalized that there's not an individual, a human being there, and and I think the the media definitely uh, is a great deficit in El Salvador, and they need to be trained. Um, so the lack of of you know investigation. Uh, 
the, the impunity and the lack of uh, access to justice is, is, is great. Now, you've also got a suggestion for an ombudsman. In El Salvador, there is an ombudsman. Unfortunately, they're very under-resourced. This probably had, I mean, El Salvador is an under-resourced country, but they put these programs, but then they don't fund them enough to actually do anything uh, progressive or, or that will have impact, and that's a, a great problem. Police abuse is, again, ubiquitous. Uh, just last year, after the uh, Pride Parade, one of, one of our friends who is part of the, of the uh, transgender community, it's actually someone that I know, and, and he's also a human rights defender of the community, it's Aldo Peña, and he was brutally beat up. I only have this little picture, but you know, I wanted to, you to see that. He's a, a young guy. He's probably a little bigger than I am, but not really much bigger than I, I am. He, he says that there were almost 54 police officers who jumped him. And then he was accused. He was the one who, he was the criminal. He was the one accused of having uh, battered the police officers. So he went through a, a terrible trauma, not only physically, but psychologically, and then legally. And it's difficult to get uh, an attorney to defend you when you're you know, low-income person in El Salvador. He had a pro bono attorney who was just a private attorney who was donating her time. Um, otherwise, I don't, I, don't, I don't think he would have made it. They, they definitely would have thrown him in jail, and who knows how, if he'd still be there or not. So, um, you know, there's the lack of laws that protect. So they have a general anti-discrimination law, but there's no law that specifically says uh, protection for LGBTI persons in El Salvador. And, you know, in terms of inclusion, participation for the community uh, to, to be able to speak about what they want or be involved or be invited, that doesn't, that doesn't happen. Um, with the hate crimes law that we'd like to have passed, with the anti-discrimination law that we'd like to have passed, and with the name and gender change, the community has organized around those issues. We, as uh, Aldes, have actually commissioned three legal research memorandums by very large firms in New York who did comparative international studies for these laws. And we presented them to the community, we presented them to the large um, public interest law firm, yet, uh, well, the, we would have presented them now almost three years ago, three, two uh, years. Nothing has happened. There has been no movement on the part of the legislators uh, in El Salvador. And this is in spite of the fact that Parliamentarians for Global Action has worked very hard in El Salvador, mostly around the Rome Statute. I don't know if you, I'm sure you're familiar with that, because that was not in place in El Salvador. Now, did, now it is, and that was through the efforts of Parliamentarians for Global Action. They've been trying to support the community uh, with legislative uh, change because they work with the legislators, but the legislators they'll say yes, we'll support it. You know, they've uh, signed off on certain agreements, but there's no action. When the community wants to meet with the legislators to you know push on the agenda for these reforms, uh, none of them want to meet with the community. I think right now there are maybe two, maybe three who are supportive, but there's like 84 legislators, and I think out of that you have to have like 54 who will vote for you. So there's a long, long way to go. Um, so with uh, all these issues, uh, there's been, it, it kind of, there's a kind of an irony, I, I feel, uh, which is an interesting one in that the last two administrations in El Salvador have been the leftist revolutionary party. And they've done a terrible job, I think, in, in supporting the LGBTI community. The last president uh, signed a executive decree which is called Decreto 56. And that decree is so that 
government uh, employees will not discriminate against LGBTI community members who come for services. Uh, however, there's no teeth to that uh, degree, decree. When it was passed, the way the community wanted, they just took out basically all the sanctions, and it's just a decree that's there, but if it's violated, nothing happens. Um, as I said, the first lady from, from that administration was very supportive. She also instituted a uh, call center so that LGBTI people could call in when they have an emergency, when they, when they need something, they have some trauma, some critical issue has come up in their lives. And there was, it was supposed to be also staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Of course, now it's not. And it was supposed to have psychologists and attorneys, for example, who would then help these uh, callers who were in these dire straits. But, you know, that, that really hasn't happened either. It's been, um, you know, th there, there are efforts, but as I said, there's not many resources that are, that are given over uh, to the organizations, and that's what really doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. So one of the things that we've noticed is that in this last election, again, leftist party, uh, the women, the trans women, for example, were able to vote with their sexual expression. And that was because they had spent a lot of time working with the tri Tribunal Supremo, I guess the, the tribunal that, that works with voting. And so they had met, I think, with them for maybe two years. They were able then to actually vote with their gender expression. And one of the FMLN party, the Revolutionary Party, won by an incredibly <coughs> small margin. In fact, I think it was somewhat like 4,000 votes. As it turns out, 4,000 LGBT folks voted. And so there is the nucleus there of a, um, of a uh, political power. And I think maybe that's one thing that's not reflected in, the, in any of the reports that I've seen, that there is that potential for political power to uh, make these legislative changes. So I just kind of want to leave you with that. Is there a way that we can help the community you know, grow in terms of its political power? And so that then they can make these changes that they're just waiting for other people to do them, and obviously they're not doing them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Montano, for the interesting experience of civil society. Um, now, as we announced at the beginning of the program, uh, we would like to hear some of your questions. We'll have a brief round of questions. So if you could please hold up your hand so my colleague, Daniela Santana, who is also the organizer of this event, I should say. We should, I, I would give her a round of applause. So please raise your hand if you have a question. Okay. Hi, my name is Trip Zanitas, and uh, thank you, Daniela, and the rest of the commissioners uh, for having your session here this week in San Francisco and in the United States. My question is for Mr. Stevenson. First of all, I'm glad to see a, a civil service uh, member of the State Department is able to make it tonight. Uh, didn't get turned around. And uh, I would love to know more about the OAS election monitoring, but I want to go right to the point of the, this panel this evening and ask you about the U.S. position with respect to the LGBTI uh, report, and specifically the question of immigration and how that might impact uh, refugees and asylum seekers from within the Americas uh, that might be fleeing LGBTQI violence. Well, thank you very much for the question. I can confirm <laughs> that we were very supportive of the LGBTI report. Uh, we were one of the very first donors to help stand up the work of the, of the commission on LGBTI issues 
first through a, a unit that was established within the commission, and then through the creation of the rapporteurship, uh, including support for, for staff that worked in the rapporteurship. Um, and uh, one of the key outcomes of that rapporteurship in the unit is, of course, this report. So we're very pleased, I think, to see the report finally being released uh, in English. Um, one of the big <coughs> challenges, I think, not only for um, the work of the commission, but also in other areas of the OAS, yes, is making sure that there's accessibility to a lot of the OAS information for English-speaking countries, uh, having representation um, for different legal traditions, uh, both common and civil, and making sure there's um, ability, uh, especially from our colleagues in the Caribbean, to the information of the commission. So we see this as very useful in a lot of different ways. With respect to immigration, asylum, refugees, this is going to be a difficult discussion it's going to be a difficult, I think, um, process uh, within the interagency uh, in Washington. I don't think any of us know where this is going to end um, and what the conclusions are going to be. Yeah, executive orders, um, to get to sort of the point I think you're, you're getting to of this week, are one thing. The process of implementing executive orders, having legislative mandates to implement, and then on the back end within the within the interagency at State Department, DHS, et cetera, in terms of implementing whatever is contained in the law and in the executive orders is a whole other process entirely. So I think we're only seeing the very beginning stages of what will be um, a policy um, outcome that may perhaps look a bit different from where we started with the executive orders. So I can't say where we're going to end up, what it's going to look like, nor what the impacts are really going to be for LGBTI uh, members of the uh, of the uh, immigrant refugee community. I'm sorry, I, I don't know I, much to say, but you knew that already, I'm sure. I'd like to say something about that as an immigration attorney who works with asylees. That will not change much. Uh, <coughs> right now, in let's say in this district, the San Francisco, uh, area, that's probably one of the better places for uh, asylum seeker, asylum seeker to file. Uh, Boston, New York. If you're going to do it in Florida, I mean, f kind of forget it, right? It's federal law, but it's applied very differently in in geographically. Um, but the law itself is pretty well established, and so asylees will be able to petition. And probably San Francisco is not going to change that much. New York is not going to change that much. Boston is not going to change that much. And the other ones, maybe they'll become a little bit more conservative, but that law will still apply. Thanks. More questions? I. Uh, hello. I don't know if this works, but I have a question through Twitter because we're very modern. Um, <laughs> And it's to Commissioner Ejiguren. Hello. Oh, sorry. Um, so we have a question through Twitter to Commissioner Ejiguren. And, um, well, it's in Spanish. So I'll say if um, the, el reconocimiento de la identidad de las personas trans como una causa de discriminación aplica a la niñez. ¿Y qué nos podría contar al respecto? En, a partir del informe, pero también de las cosas que venimos trabajando en la relatoría, eh, ciertamente eh, la discriminación y la violencia, sea contra personas eh, trans eh, o personas eh, lesbianas u otro, o, o, o gays, etc., eh, se inician normalmente según tiene recogido desde la, desde la niñez, desde la temprana edad, pueden empezar en la misma casa, en la misma familia, en el mismo seno familiar. Eh, muchos de los testimonios dan cuenta pues, de personas que tuvieron que finalmente abandonar sus hogares o que fueron echados de ellos eh, al poder tener cierta independencia por la hostilidad, por la agresión que sentían dentro de su propio hogar o en el colegio, en la escuela, el bullying, la violencia temas que a veces no son tomados en cuenta o abordados, incluso por las autoridades educativas o por las autoridades escolares. Entonces, claro, eh, hay aspectos, eh, cuando hablamos ya, por ejemplo, de una identidad de género, eh, puede producirse, puede expresarse, o hasta la propia persona pueda percibirla en distintos momentos de su vida, 
Algunos lo pueden percibir o lo pueden expresar desde su niñez, otros no. Pero si sufren medidas eh, represivas, medidas, entre comillas, reeducativas o correctivas que sancionan, que agreden eh, esas expresiones eh, tempranas de, de su identidad, sin duda estamos ante formas de violencia que son eh, mucho más graves porque se trata de personas mucho más eh, eh, vulnerables. Eh, creo que es un tema que debe ser sin duda abordado, pero en algunos países de, del continente he estado revisando, pues hay una campaña muy agresiva, eh, dicen contra la ideología de género, que no quieren que estos temas se toquen, se enseñen desde el colegio el respeto a la identidad de género libremente asumida a, o a, el respeto a la diversidad. Entonces creo que sí es un tema muy delicado, no soy un especialista particularmente en el asunto, pero creo que sí debemos ser conscientes de ello. A veces se visualizan más eh, los temas de, de la violencia extrema, el homicidio, la agresión contra mujeres trans, contra personas gay, lesbianas, eh, etc. Pero sí hay un escenario preocupante a nivel que se puede estar iniciando desde el niñez de una violencia física, psicológica y de una hostilidad que no puede ser, eh, digamos, indiferente para las autoridades y para, el, y para la sociedad. Thank you, Commissioner Yiguren. Given the uh, advanced hour, um, if there is one last brief question. Okay. So I guess um, we would like to thank then all our panelists. Thank you very much to all of you. And if you could follow us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, and the Commission's website as well, uh, so you can stay up to date with all the new developments and, and um, the work of the Commission in this and other very important human rights areas of, for the protection and promotion of human rights. And right now, if you could join us for a, a small reception. Thank you very much. Things going on the State Department. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Canadian has I been very supportive. Really, uh, yeah.